Hey, everybody. Welcome to another edition of On The Move presented by Move Outdoors. Uh, sorry we've been absent a little bit the last couple of weeks. Life's been pretty hectic, actually, for uh, pretty much all of us. Um, big congrats to Ryan, who unfortunately isn't with us on this podcast, but him and his now wife, uh, Lexi, got married last Saturday. And uh, unfortunately, that just led no time for editing podcasts. I spent the week back home in Pennsylvania um, hanging out with Tyler and Ryan and family and didn't really have as much time to myself as I as I thought I was going to be able to and came back to Iowa and it is hunting season for everyone basically across the country except for maybe some far southern states that are still waiting to open but uh, October is finally here we're all excited so we're sorry that there was a little bit of a gap in the podcast but we're trying to get it restarted here now and keep up with consistent uploads so we hope you enjoyed this pretty interesting story that happened to me uh, a couple weeks ago. But before we get into that, we're going to do our typical little roundtable here and just discuss what we've done in the outdoors in the last week. So Tyler, what have you been up to in the last week in the outdoors? Well, um, Pennsylvania's archery season has officially kicked off um, statewide as of this past Saturday. But I live in a special WMU that starts uh, about two three weeks early i think it's two weeks technically um so i've been able to get hunting out you know a couple days here and there um had some great run-ins um i hunt a lot with my older brother um he shot a lot less interesting things over the time he's hunting so i typically try and take him out and try and get him good shots before i take shots on stuff and uh this year so far we've had a run-in with a really nice eight point within 30 yards. Um, we've uh, missed our opportunity on a bear at five yards. That was mostly my fault of uh, freaking out when, you know, a bear stands up at five yards unexpectedly. Um, our area is unknown for bear. So when, when a bear pops out that close um, and it was a pretty nice size bear, um, I had a little bit of a premature reaction and uh, didn't get shot on him, but you know, a lot of a lot of good sign in the area that i hope to find sign in and uh, a lot of good action in that area so you know hopefully i can get more hunts uh this week's relatively warm for the season i guess you know 70s 80s i'm um, not super interested in taking too many sits after work taking this time to get stuff done at the house um so this weekend supposed to dip again hopefully saturday rain pending i'll be able to get some time out in the woods That sounds really eventful, um, really eventful. So hopefully when you can get back out of the woods, you can capitalize on that buck you guys saw or even that bear. That'd be really, really sweet if you guys could capitalize on the bear. Do you, I know your brother has a bear tag. Do you have a bear tag or no? I do not. I, I typically don't buy one, especially knowing that I'd be hunting the area I'd be hunting. I definitely would never have expected to have a run in with one. But uh, maybe, maybe I should change that philosophy. Yeah, maybe. Uh, but I mean, like you said, I, I grew up hunting that area, uh, of course, as you know, and I really can't believe you saw a bear on that property. I mean, it, it's a mix of like awesome and a little bit I'm kind of dumbfounded because there's never even been stories of bear on that property in the time in the 20 ish years. I've been conscious enough to to know about that property and, and hunt it or have my dad hunt it. Um yeah, I, I told my dad that you saw a bear, and he's like, on on that game lands? No, he didn't. No, he didn't. I'm like, it stood up five yards from him. I'm pretty sure he knew what it was, and he's like, that's that's crazy. I've never heard of a bear on that game lands. I've never thought uh, I'd ever see a bear on that game lands. So, heck, maybe that's a pretty good sign. Maybe that means there's not that many people going back in there. Yeah, yeah, I... Uh... I mean, we hear stories of people seeing bears in like pup and like yards and stuff, but the, the, the bear harvest, I would venture to guess, in our area is probably pretty damn low. Um, I, I think so the entire one is, management unit shoots like ten a year, if that. <laughs> <laughs> That's wild. Yeah, it, it, had my brother been the the lead walker because we were we were. We had missed the opportunity on the on the buck and we're trying to track it out of the, the hunting area we had found it 
and stumbled upon the bear and I was the first one in line. And like I said, I had a little bit of a premature reaction and it, it left our line of sight. So like had my older brother been leading, he, he may have had a shot. If it, we only ever saw its head, um, the way it was shielded by the, the bush, it must've been either napping in or eating on as we walked up. Um, but yeah, I mean, we get up a decent chunk of the bear harvest in our WM. <laughs> yeah, you you guys would have been like ten percent of it, if not more. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, as for me, like I said, I I was back in Pennsylvania last week. Um, so Tyler, you and I did get out one night. Um, unfortunately, yep. we didn't see anything. There was acorns falling all around us. It seemed like it was going to be a good night. The wind was in our favor. I don't know if we were a little too loud getting in and maybe the, the deer got spooked or if we just weren't quite set up in the right spot. I'm not entirely sure, but um, unfortunately we didn't see anything that night. And then uh, now that I'm back in Iowa here, I've gotten two sits in so far. Uh, the first time um, I tried to take my kayak up a river and figure out one, if I could actually paddle all the way up the river to where I wanted to. And two, I knew where a buck was bedding. Uh, and I thought that I could get in there and capitalize on the early season before he really saw too much pressure with the right wind. And I was uh, unfortunately wrong on both accounts, but I did have a camera on the exit trail of the bedding and I never got him leaving. I also never heard any deer run away from me. So either I really screwed up and they busted me way before I got there or the deer just weren't there um, that day. And then last night I went ahead and kayaked a mile and a half down a river um, and hit up a piece of landlocked public land that I was able to watch from the road uh, from during the summertime and saw quite a few nice bucks out in a, in a private soybean field that backed up to the public along with a ton of does and decided to go in there, kind of had a plan of attack in mind with the way the wind was. I ended up having eight deer within 20 yards of me, uh, throughout the night. And I got set up at six ten, and dark or legal shoot was seven eighteen. Um, pretty much six twenty on, I had deer within 30 yards of me. And it was really cool, but unfortunately, there's no doe tags for that county, or at least I don't have a doe tag for that county. And they were all does, so I couldn't shoot any, which kind of sucked because there was some some big mama standing there at 20 yards just begging me for an arrow. Uh, I kind of wish <laughs> Iowa gave me a statewide doe tag instead of a statewide either sex tag. Um, so the, the punishment for shooting one of those does would have been I don't have an Iowa buck tag for bow season anymore. And I was not about to do that. Not on October 3rd. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, and then of course the, the story that we're going to get into a little bit here also happened within the last uh, week and a half or so where, uh, my brother asked me to help him track one of his, uh, coworkers deer that he shot in that special management unit. Tyler was just mentioning and it's it is quite the story let me let me put it that way it is quite it's quite the, the conversation <laughs> it will start well, quite the conversation that is for sure yes it will start quite the conversation because there's there's some things that this guy did wrong and there's some things that uh well I don't want to I don't want to spoil it so I'll, I'll just say that there's there's a lot to discuss after the story's over I think in my opinion um, so I'll, I'll jump right into it here. Uh, my brother asked me, so I, I got back to Pennsylvania on, uh, Saturday, the, I got to look at the date real quick. Saturday, the 23rd, I got back to Pennsylvania, Saturday, September 23rd. Um, and it was raining. Uh, apparently it'd been raining pretty much all Friday, all Saturday, and it ended up raining all of Sunday oh, yeah. as well. Um, from one of the hurricanes that came through, but my brother's coworker decided to go out in the rain Saturday night and actually ended up shooting a doe at like four 30 in the afternoon, but, um, was having a hard time finding it. And he said, it looked like a good shot. 
seemed like it went in right behind the shoulder. The crossbow bolt went in right behind the shoulder. And uh, his co-worker, I guess, kicked it a couple times throughout the night, which kind of confused me because if he was kicking it, then he didn't shoot it right behind the shoulder. At least that's what I thought. And uh, my brother asked, well, he asked my brother to, to help him track. And my brother asked me if I'd like to go with and bring my dog, Winnie, who some of you who watch uh, the pheasant hunting videos on the channel or have listened to podcasts before, you know, I have a black lab. She's trained for upland bird dog hunting um, named Winnie. And I've never done any sort of blood tracking with her before, but I figured it's been raining for 24 hours at the point of starting to track since he shot this deer. The best chance of finding it is to bring a dog. And I thought she's a hunting dog. So she's not unfamiliar with the smell of blood. She's around me. She's very familiar with the smell of deer. So I'll give her a shot. And uh, actually part of the reason I decided to bring Winnie is because of the dog tracker that I used out in Wyoming who had an upland dog that was also a tracking dog. And I talked to him extensively about that while we were tracking my elk, um, which if you haven't seen, go watch Perseverance, a Wyoming elk hunt on the Move Outdoors YouTube channel. But uh, he kind of gave me the idea that it won't really ruin the upland hunting or get her too excited about chasing deer so i decided what the heck we'll try it we get over to my brother's co-worker's house um i should probably come up with a generic name that's not his actual name just uh for the sake of not needing to continuously say my brother's co-worker so um oh we'll call him john john doe uh so we get to John's house and kind of he introduces himself. We talk for a few minutes um, and kind of I get I get Winnie out of the truck and introduce her to John. And he takes us down to where he ended up shooting this thing, which is actually just right behind his house. There's a, a patch of public right behind his house that he has permission to or not permission to hunt on, but um, that he hunts because it's public right behind his house. And he took us down right to where he shot it, took us to first blood, showed Winnie first blood, and Winnie instantly just put her head down and started tracking like she'd been doing it her whole life. I mean, she was pulling me along to the point I was actually getting irritated at her because she was tripping me in the wet grass. Um, but she was following the blood like a, like a professional. And I kept asking John, you know, is, is she on the right trail? Is she following blood? And he kept saying, yeah, this is the exact path that the deer took. This is the exact path that the deer took. And then we hit a Y and when he wanted to go to the left, he wanted to go to the right. John wanted to go to the right. So instead of following Winnie, uh, John insisted on going to the right. So I took Winnie to the right and she immediately lost all interest. So I knew that wasn't the right path. And John said, I, th I think she was right going to the left before, but how about I just take you back to last blood instead? Because I have it marked. Okay, we'll just go back to last blood then. Because at this point, I was thinking, hey, she seems to know what she's doing here. So I'll just take her back to last blood. She's already got the scent. And we'll see if she just picks it right back up. And if not, we can always reset and start again. And uh, obviously, I'm not a not a professional tracker or anything like that. Like I said, I've, I've never taken a deer track before in my life. Uh so at least not a dog deer track. So um, on the way back to last blood, then Winnie, who I, I kind of, I was trying to keep her out in the open a little more. She took me through this real thick patch and I couldn't understand why until my brother followed us through. And when my brother followed us through, he found the guy's crossbow bolt uh, from the shot, just laying in the grass right there. And that's when it really clicked to me that like, okay, she's, she is actively tracking this deer. This is not like she got lucky and went on the right path. She's actively tracking this deer. She knows what she's doing at this point. And we get back to last blood and John mentions, you know, my wife was helping me track last night and uh, she says that she kicked a deer and found some blood in the bed of the kicked deer about 60 yards from here. And I said, okay, well, we'll put Winnie on the blood that you know of because you don't know exactly where your wife's blood was because he said he never went to check it out, which was pretty foolish of him, in my opinion. But um, put Winnie at last blood, and she instantly starts heading in the direction the guy said, gets to the bed, and she's licking the bed, and he goes, 
what's she doing? And I said, she, there's blood there. She's licking it. She, she knows that there's blood there. So she's licking the blood. And, um, she kept pushing then past the bed. Cause I, I kind of, I had to prompt her a little bit to get past the bed, but once we got past the bed, she started on the track again and the trail split and there was a deer trail going left and a deer trail going right. We took a couple feet down the deer trail to the left. She decided that was the wrong move, turned around, went to the deer trail to the right, took us through a little swampy section. And then we went around a corner and there was a small opening and I'm watching Winnie at this point and she sticks her nose up and she starts air scenting. And I'm about to say it has to be close because she's air scenting. When my brother who was right behind me goes, there she is. And she is six, maybe seven yards away. And I'm thinking, oh my goodness, she's dead. It, I mean, it's a deer laying there, not moving. I can't see the head at this point. So I'm thinking she's dead. And I'm like, awesome. We found her. This is so incredible. And I'm, I'm getting excited. My, my voice is going up. I'm like getting ready to praise the heck out of Winnie, get the phone out, get some pictures going. And then the deer sticks its head up. And as soon as it sees us, of course, it wants to move and it tries to get up fails the first time and then gets up and you can clearly see that it can't really use its front legs anymore. And what had happened was John shot ended up going through one lung right behind the shoulder, right where you'd want it. But it must've been at a severe enough downhill angle that the exit was through the opposite side leg. So he basically just got one lung. He didn't get heart. He didn't get, anything else but one lung so this deer is slowly bleeding to death on one lung basically especially because with how low the hit was the thoracic cavity couldn't fill up so she's not drowning in her own blood as as horrible as that is that that sounds to say i mean when you when you shoot a deer in the high lungs it's drowning in its own blood as well as you know not being able to breathe but uh, when you shoot an animal low in the lungs it's more the fact that it can't breathe. Uh, so the body cavity is not filling with any blood because of how low the hit is. So she's just continuously bleeding and is, is just slowly bleeding to death essentially. Um, and this deer runs maybe 20 yards, maybe, and then flops back down. And then we're, we're looking at her going, she's going to die. There's no, no if, ands or buts about it. She's going to die, but it's about five o'clock on Sunday. And, uh, if you're going to wait for her to die, quote unquote, naturally, you're gonna, you're gonna have to wait till, till tomorrow morning and come get her. And, uh, John at this point said something that I agreed with at the time and, and still agree with from an ethical and moral standpoint that you need to put the deer out of its misery. We found it. It's still alive. You need to put it out of its misery. And I, I still to this second agree with that sentiment. Um, that deer was suffering. It was a bad shot, not, not a bad shot, but a bad outcome on a, on a somewhat poorly placed shot. Um, and John decided he was going to go back and get his, go back to his house and get his crossbow. So we, John and I go back to his house to get his crossbow. I bring Winnie. My brother stays with the deer um, just to make sure it didn't move any farther. And we get back to John's house. John goes in, get his crossbow and heads back up. He asks if I'm going to join. And I mind you, I don't know John personally. This is the first time I've ever met John. I don't know how good of a shot he is. Uh, I don't know how my dog's going to react at the deer getting shot again. I don't know, um, how the deer's going to react to having my dog close. I don't know if John is safe enough with a crossbow to absolutely not shoot my dog. So I decided that I would stay at John's house and wait for the, Hey, the deer's dead. And then I'd come up for pictures and stuff, just mostly for the dog's safety. And about five minutes goes by. And I get a call from my brother saying, hey, it's dead. I said, okay. You guys, I assume, are just going to drag it right back. Yeah, yeah, we're going to drag it back. Okay. And I wait about 10 minutes. And I don't see them. And I haven't heard anything from them. And I'm getting a little antsy at this point. 
So I called my brother back and said, Hey, um, I'm just going to come to you guys and get pictures there or help you guys drag or whatever. Um, I just want Winnie to be there and be a part of this at this point. And I, I was tired of just standing around. <laughs> so m what my brother says though, is that John was coming back to the house to grab his truck, which I contested because I was thinking, well, one, it's a 200 yard drag. If that it's, it's not a big deal. Just drag, drag the thing back. And two, um, John and I had a conversation while we were walking back to his house that if he's going to shoot this deer again, ethically and morally, he's in the right. Legally, it's kind of a gray area because I wouldn't consider what he was doing hunting because it's not really hunting. It's, it's kind of dispatching wounded game. And uh, John agreed with me. So I said, you know, you should be careful. Don't let people see you because I don't know, you know, if if somebody calls the game commission or somebody calls the police or something and you've put this animal out of its misery on a Sunday, I don't know the legality of that. Um, and he decided anyway that he was going to he weighed the risk and thought that it was right to go get his truck instead of just dragging the animal 200 yards. So he comes back and grabs his truck and drives up there. And then he does one of the stupidest possible things he could have. And he parks directly in his neighbor's yard, one of his neighbor's yards. And I, when I say directly in the yard, I don't mean like half on the pavement, half on the grass. I don't mean parked in the, in the road with the four ways on. I mean, he has full pulled all four tires off the road into his neighbor's yard. And I didn't realize that at the time because I had to walk my dog back up there. So I'm walking Winnie up mostly just to see if they need help at this point. And an old man comes out and is, and is walking around John's truck and uh, goes, you need to move this truck right now. Talking to me. And I told the gentleman, I, I can't, I don't have the, I don't have the keys. It's not my truck. I don't, I can't move the truck. And uh, this, this gentleman was clearly, I'd say he had a chip on his shoulder because he got he John parked on his property he has every right to be mad, but he was kind of excessively mad immediately, in my opinion, um, where he was he was kind of screaming at me, uh, sent a few curse words my way. And I'm just kind of look, it's it's not my truck. Um, the situation is your neighbor uh, shot a deer yesterday and called me to help him recover it. And I, th that's what the dog's here for. We recovered the deer. He's going to be dragging the deer up out of the woods here shortly. And the guy, after a couple minutes, finally calmed down a little bit. And basically what he told me was, well, if I was you, I would walk away because I'm about to call the cops. So I took his advice because I certainly didn't want to escalate it. And uh, I thought maybe if I walked away, he wouldn't call the cops. I was wrong on both cat, both counts. So when John finally came out of the woods with the deer, John and my brother came out of the woods with, with uh, the deer, the old man was taking more pictures of John's truck and got into an altercation with John where apparently the, now th this is all secondhand from John. I didn't see any of this. So this is kind of a, he said, she said kind of thing. But my understanding of the story is that the old man started, started getting pretty mad at John and stuck his finger in John's chest and uh, John kind of stepped up to it and the old man real quick pulled his finger back and turned around and went back inside the house saying, I'll, I got something for you. I got something for you. And John loaded up the deer with my brother. They drove back down to John's house and it wasn't a minute and a half later that the cops showed up. So I don't know how long it had been at this point since he called the cops, but I will say remarkable response time, absolutely remarkable response time. But at this point, the Pennsylvania state police show up at John's house. John did the right thing. He flagged him down, said, Hey, uh, I know why you're here. I'm the one that the guy called about. This is my house this is my truck. This is why he called. And I'm thinking, okay, good. This is, this is going to go pretty smoothly. He's going to explain the situation. Maybe game wardens come out. Maybe game wardens don't come out. It'll kind of depend on on 
maybe the police officer, maybe game wardens are already called. I wasn't sure at this point. But I figured game wardens would be involved, particularly since my thought was if the guy mentioned anything about the deer, the police are going to call the game wardens, and then the game wardens are going to come out. And what ended up happening then was the police officer asked John for his ID, and John decided that that was some reason not a reasonable request, I guess, and went on a loud and long rant slash tirade about why he didn't need to give the police officer his ID and why this was infringing on his freedoms and First Amendment rights and Second Amendment rights and blah, blah, blah. And the police officer did an excellent job of not getting irritated and uh, just went back into her car. And my brother and I, of course, when that's going on, are standing off to the side, rolling our eyes through the back of our heads so hard that we could see our brain. Um, and <laughs> it wasn't five minutes later uh, that the game warden showed up. And the game warden comes up, asks which one of us shot the deer. Uh, my brother and I pointed to John because John was the one that shot the deer. And... The game warden asked for ID, and he instantly gave his ID to the game warden, which was a point of frustration for my brother and I. But uh, after that, John was very cooperative with the game warden. John spent about 45 minutes or so in the game warden's truck. Um, at this point, the game warden and the state police hadn't asked for IDs from my brother and I. They hadn't asked for stories from my brother and I, which was a little surprising, but we were we were hanging out at this point, just kind of waiting for them to give us the official okay since we were technically witnesses. And after about 45 minutes of talking to the game warden in the game warden's vehicle, John comes back, and the game warden asks, who's the dog handler? I raise my hand. He calls me back to the truck asks for my side of the story. I give him my side of the story. He asked for my identification and a phone number to reach me. I gave him both of those. And he said, okay, now could you please send your brother back here? So I sent my brother back there. He got the same information from my brother and uh, came down then afterward saying, you know, all three of your guys' stories match. So that's awesome. And what we're going to do here is not cite John for poaching. Uh, instead, he decided to charge John with illegal take, which he explained would be the same as you hit a deer with your car and it's suffering on the side of the road and you pulled out a pistol and shot it, which is illegal in the state of Pennsylvania. And he said that uh, it's kind of the lowest charge that he could give, primarily because um, he was called there by the state police. So through talking with the game warden, what the game warden said was that morally and ethically, he was on Kyle's side. I'm going to have to redo that. Morally and ethically, he was on John's side. But because he was called out there by the police and there was a uh, listed dispatch of him to that location, a listed call he had to give some sort of charge out for illegal take of an animal on Sunday. And he said that, you know, he, he can't say that he would have done anything differently in terms of dispatching the animal on a Sunday because it's the right thing to do. But where John screwed up was getting the police called on him. And the warden even said that if he had been out driving around and just happened upon us dragging the deer out of the woods and we gave him the story, it would probably be a warning saying, hey, don't do not do that again. Um, and that's it. But because he was called out by the police, he had to give a fine for illegal take of an animal on a Sunday and then uh, took the deer and took John's crossbow bolt that he used for the finishing shot. Which... Um, kind of ends the story and Tyler I told this to you when it was fresher in my mind did I miss anything that uh, I should bring up here no I think you, you obviously you, you, you pointed out that he said you know legally you were wrong despite the fact that morally you, you could be justified um, 
it, it kind of felt like a letter of the law versus feeling of the law. What, how's that saying go? Letter of the law versus intent of the law or, or something like that. Yeah, I can't, I can't think of the exact saying, but I know exactly what you're trying to say. But yeah. yeah. So I, I had wanted a picture of me and Winnie with this deer because I, I was still, yeah. I, and I am still incredibly proud of her for what she accomplished, especially having never tracked an animal in her life or a deer uh -huh. in her life. Um, but it didn't seem right afterwards. The only picture I got is uh, the picture that's going to be on the Facebook post kind of uh, for this podcast, which is a picture of the deer on the back of a game warden vehicle because the game warden took the deer. Uh, but what I really want to talk about here is kind of the message that this really sends to yeah. the, the message I received from the game warden basically was that legally speaking in Pennsylvania, if you shoot a deer on Saturday and it is not a Sunday that you can hunt, which there are three Sundays currently and they are all in November. If you shoot a deer on a Saturday and you find it alive on Sunday, you are legally required to let that animal suffer until legal shooting hours Monday morning. You can't come back at midnight Monday. You can't come back at five minutes before legal shooting light. You have to wait until exactly legal shooting light or later on Monday morning to dispatch that animal, which kind of sickens me. I think that the, the issue... One of one of the, the big issues too is it's it's almost like we had discussed personally splitting hairs because of the yeah. way he said that the law is written because it it wasn't the fact that he was he wasn't getting charged with poaching and it wasn't necessarily like because he hunted the deer it's because he killed the deer yes so in theory if somebody hits a deer on a Sunday with their car. Should they, would they not be charged? See, and that's, I, I tried asking the warden that and didn't get what I would consider a satisfactory answer. He did mention that regardless of whether or not John had shot it with his crossbow or put a finishing shot in it with a firearm or slit its throat with a knife, that it was illegal take of an animal on Sunday. Which leads me to believe and this is this is kind of where the law confuses me because the law states you can't hunt an animal on Sunday. But the way this was treated, it, it was flat out treated that he did not hunt an animal on a Sunday. He dispatched an animal on a Sunday. So yeah, I, that's where kind of the legality of it confuses me, confounds me a little bit. And, and I almost kind of get like mix of what the game warden was really saying. Because it seemed, to me at least, I mean, I didn't get explicit words because I didn't ask him the explicit question of, is this considered hunting on a Sunday? But th the way he phrased his, what, his answers and the way he kind of presented this was that it was not hunting on a Sunday, but it was still illegal take of an animal on Sunday, which that kind of delineation between the two seems like a big legal gray area to me. Yeah, because like, the, the law says no hunting on a Sunday. Le, le, the the way that he, that he is interpreting the law and the way he's enforcing the law would almost make it possible that you could be charged and say you got shot a deer on Saturday and it died on Sunday. And that's kind of what I thought too. The way that this was phrased almost from this interaction was, yeah, if I make a bad shot on a deer Saturday and let it lay till Sunday and then recover it. If the wrong person sees me pulling that deer out on a Sunday, I can be charged with an illegal take of animal on Sunday, especially like, like in the case of like you just said, a gut shot or something where it takes the animal 12 to 24 hours to die. If I shoot it at last light on Saturday night and come back, you know, first thing in the morning, Sunday, it might only be dead for like, an hour, maybe two hours. So that body's still going to be pretty warm. How do you prove that you shot it the night before and not get charged? Yeah, exactly. 
it's there, there's a, there's obviously a lot of shots and this is obviously not one of those shots that are gonna you're gonna you're gonna hit the deer and you're gonna have wounded it but it will not be lethal so like in that case scenario like maybe we're hypocritical with splitting hair this hair as well but in that case obviously it does not there you have no obligation to make a follow-up shot on it the next day but in this case that deer for all intents and purposes was dying it was actively dying yes and it was doing so in a not so you know awesome manner it it, it was it, it was being drug out it was suffering mm -hmm. that deer was gonna die we just you know quicken the process for respect of the animal yet the way the pgc is litigating such manners we're, we're in the wrong but it it, it just as, as, we're, as we're discussing here it, does, it just doesn't make sense no no it doesn't it, it, it just i don't want to say that it's like advocating for letting an animal suffer but in the same sense, it it kind of is. Like, yeah. the, the, the way it was phrased is, and, and this is exactly what the game warden said to us, is that legally you need to let that animal suffer overnight. You need, need to let that animal lay overnight until legal shooting hours Monday morning, not five minutes before legal shooting hours. He said that it is, he said even if we had found that animal last night, and put a finishing shot in it. So it, this would have been Saturday night. If you found it after legal shooting hours Saturday night and put a finishing shot in it, it's the same charge. Which and just so, blows my mind that, like, y you found a dying, barely able to move animal. And instead of being able to, to dispatch that animal, you are legally required to let it suffer until the next morning you could legally hunt in legal shooting hours i i get in in one way i get where they're coming from if if they say anybody in the woods hunting right now is illegal whether or not you're dispatching a wounded animal or not they, they make it easier on themselves to enforce let's say poaching or you know you know they, if someone's in the woods with a bow where and it's regardless of what they're not they're doing is illegal then it's easier for them to enforce laws but it, it with with the interaction that they had with you guys and and, and, and the explanation that you should have been able to give them you you would think that you could have walked away you know maybe educated but not punished as you were as, as he was and and that's kind of another interesting point because I feel like it would have been an education experience if it wasn't for the fact that the guy was called by the state police. I, I, I wonder what the outcome would have been if we called like the regional PGC office and said, this is the situation. What can we do? Or we're going to dispatch this animal. I, I don't know. I don't know what, what, if anything would have changed. Yeah, I mean, let, 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 look at this uh, from the, we, from the PGC standpoint. They, that guy is leaving that interaction no more a fan of the PGC than he started that interaction. He's not he he, he he's not going to advocate. He's not going to support. And he's not going to appreciate the PGC's mission any more than he started that interaction. No, because. No, in fact I, I'd argue that he now has less respect for the PGC. And yeah. in fact, I know he does. And whether or not that's fair or not, it, it, it I think, I, I think w when you take the interaction as it happened, I think it's a fair feeling to feel like the PGC was just there to screw you at that, in that particular interaction. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I certainly think John has a right to be aggravated at the way that the situation played out. Um, 
I certainly know that I would not be interacting at all ever again with that neighbor because it would never be a positive interaction again. But oh, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I, I know he's upset with how it went down because, and, and I thought this was kind of interesting too. The game warden, the guy, John had mentioned that uh, the game warden was very, or sorry, John had mentioned that he was upset that he was going to lose the meat from this dough. The game warden then said that um, the meat's going to be donated to like a soup kitchen, homeless shelter, whatever, which that's, you know, that's nice. But Mm -hmm. then the game warden immediately after that said that there's a program you can sign up for if you're interested where I will call you at any hour of the night that I am working. And if I have like, a poached deer or a freshly road killed deer. And I call you, um, I can come drop it off and then you can have the whole deer. And I was kind of almost, I I didn't ask this in the moment, but I, I, I wanted to, um, I don't know if you'd say common sense, stop me or what, but I wanted to ask, well, why can't you just donate the deer to me real quick then? And I donate it right back to John. Like, (laughs) thanks. And, and what's crazy here is that, or, I mean, John did get off kind of nice where he's not getting a poaching charge. He's not losing his hunting rights, um, but he obviously lost the deer. He lost the crossbow bolt, and he said he's going to try and fight the charge in court, which personally I feel is a bad decision. Um, I feel like that is not going to play out well i think if anything he's going to somehow get his charges elevated but you know not uh not my pig not my farm there yeah i i I would agree there i think despite the fact that we disagree with him being charged regardless i feel like at this point that officer due to the way the law is written could legally and probably gotten it to go through charged him with much you know more severe fines i mean oh absolutely whether whether or not you want to define what we did as hunting or what you guys did so i was i was there what 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 happened as hunting john did yeah 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 what 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 john John did did. was hunting as hunting it, it 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 it's again it's 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 really splitting hairs like so like legally they might have been able to call it a poach and then he could lose his license for maybe forever. That that's kind of where I'm at too. Plus, I mean, um, if this charge gets elevated to poaching, the game commission is within every right or the game commission has every right. I should say to take John's truck, John's crossbow, everything and anything that was used in conjunction with this could legally be seized by the game commission. Yeah. And that's where I'm kind of, I, like you said, regardless of how I feel about how this played all out, I, I do think fighting it in court, like he plans on doing is, is probably a bad idea. Yeah. And and yeah, I don't, I, I don't know that the, 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 the way the law is written supports him. No, it doesn't. No, because, I mean, the law really has no regard for an ethical or moral code. There's a legal no, code, it's... and then you're, there's your ethical code and your moral code, and they're, they are not the same. Yeah, exactly. And, and uh, it's a shame that all this came about for for lack of better terms, all of this kind of came about because John was lazy and decided to go get his truck. Yeah, well, yeah. Well, while we um, on move outdoors, will not advocate for illegal activities. If you're gonna be doing something borderline questionable, be smart about it at the very least. Maybe, maybe don't be obvious. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 Obviously, obviously throughout this whole podcast and that's something maybe I should have should have mentioned in the beginning, we do not condone any sort of legal behavior whatsoever. So, legally speaking, yes, John was in the wrong for shooting this deer. And that's kind of where 
I myself uh, am kind of struggling with the with the dynamic that's come about with this because, yes, he was wrong for shooting the deer legally, but ethically and morally, I'm on his side for shooting it and putting it out of its misery. So, yeah, like that's where and in my mind, I think the distinction is. In my mind, he did not poach this animal. He put it out of its misery. He he dispatched a wounded animal. But according to the state of Pennsylvania, that what he did was illegal. Or at least the Pennsylvania Game Commission. Yeah, I think I think they're I think maybe in the future they're uh, obviously at some point Pennsylvania will get with the times and we will be able to hunt every single Sunday. But in cases where, let's say you shoot deer the last day of the season, and all of a sudden the next day there's no longer any deer hunting, and this situation happens, um, I think there needs to be some kind of distinction there that if you had, you know, vitally wounded or lethally wounded an animal that will not expire within x amount of time you could make a follow-up shot again you know enforcing such a law it it would it, be it would it could create some gray area with poaching but there, i feel like there should be some kind of understanding there for us as hunters trying to do the right thing and not get for all tens of purposes crapped on for for doing the right thing <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, I totally agree. And and you brought up a great point there. I hadn't even thought about the, you know, what if you shoot a deer on the last day of season and come across it the next morning and it's still alive. I I had not even that thought hadn't even crossed my mind. I was thinking this of this strictly like a Saturday to Sunday thing, but no, you're absolutely right. I mean, if you shoot a deer on the last day of bow season, there's a gap before rifle season in Pennsylvania. So if you shoot a deer on the last day of bow season, you have to wait to the first day of rifle to to technically go dispatch it. I mean, it would certainly, if it was going to die, it would die between the last day of bow season and the first day of rifle season. But, you know, just hypothetically speaking, would you have to wait to the opening day of rifle season to go dispatch that animal then? Which, cause if so, that's, it's a little silly. And, and to, to um, go a little deeper into something that you had said there, the officer, the game warden did say that, Hopefully this won't be an issue in the future. He he had mentioned multiple times he's he's very pro Sunday hunting. Um, he's like it's kind of ridiculous that what you did is illegal, but the way the law is written, it, it's illegal. Um, so I don't know. I I think I think this whole experience is just something that that. Uh, well, I wanted to put out here because I want people to kind of formulate their own opinion on what they think is right, obviously, uh, in, in regards to this situation. Um, and I think you're right, too. If you say if you wound an animal on Saturday, you can go finish it off on a Sunday. I think that opens a big legal gray area where and I'd like to think most people wouldn't do this, but I think there is a certain subset of the hunting population that would intentionally make a bad shot. Or, yeah. or try and force a shot and then use that as an excuse to track an animal that they hit, I don't know, they hit in the leg or something. Something that's clearly not going to die the next morning and put a finishing shot on it. Yeah, that that's, 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 that's the thing. Like, it, it, it's so hard to do something right that's going to work 100% of the time. Yeah. And be 100% effective because there's always going to be people trying to take advantage of the system, no matter what the system is in place. Yeah, I, I agree. There's always going to be people who think the system doesn't apply to them or or think they can do whatever. Actually, as a, as a great evidence point to that, in multiple Pennsylvania hunting groups today, for some reason, baiting was a super hot topic today for some reason. And there was a bunch of people in these Pennsylvania hunting groups on Facebook asking, how far do I need to be set up from bait for it to be legal? 
which in my mind is them basically admitting, hey, I just dumped a 50-pound bag of corn 100 yards from my tree stand. Is that legal, or can a game warden bust me for that? <laughs> <laughs> well, while I have no issue with people hunting however legally and ethically they want, if Pennsylvania ever legalizes deer baiting, I will be severely disappointed. Me too. Me too. I, I don't even hunt there anymore, but me too. Um, yeah. I, as someone who's, who's actually hunted deer over bait before, um, seek a deer down in Maryland. It's not quite hunting. Um, and I think in a state with as many hunters as Pennsylvania, it would open a lot of issues. And I think with CWD becoming a thing, it's never, I don't think baiting is really ever going to be allowed. Now, granted, there is a few spots in Pennsylvania you can legally bait, but they require like permission forms and all kinds of stuff. There, there's a whole bunch of stuff you have to fill out from the PGC. I'm not entirely sure what the process is, so I'm not going to speak about it. But I know there is technically a couple spots you can legally bait in Pennsylvania. Mm. Uh, and I think they're all down by the Maryland border, but don't nobody quote me on that, please. Um, and certainly don't take anything I've said in this as law. <laughs> this is not legal advice. <laughs> <laughs> None of this has been legal advice. Let me put that disclaimer in there. Not a single bit of this has been legal advice. Um, yeah, I just... Uh, I hope baiting doesn't become a thing. Let me, let me just let me just put it that way. I hope baiting doesn't become a thing in Pennsylvania. Um, it's certainly it's quite different than than traditional deer hunting, and it might be effective for getting like one to two does a year, but big bucks over bait are rare, unless you're in Texas and there's three of them per four hundred square yards. <laughs> but yeah, guys. Um, I, I really just, I wanted to get this story out there. I wanted people to hear this, kind of kind of form their own opinion of the situation. Of course, like I've said before, I used fake names here because I don't want to get the guy in any sort of trouble. I don't want to name drop him. Um, his name's not John. <laughs> but uh, I want you guys to form your own opinions of how this played out and kind of, if you disagree with the ruling, maybe talk to uh, your local legislator or something. The best thing you could do is get Sunday hunting legalized in Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania is one of the last states. I can't remember exactly how many there are at this time, but it's one of the last states that doesn't allow Sunday hunting throughout the entirety of deer season. Um, at least even, or I should say even, with the limitation of at least private land. Um, Cause there's a couple states you can only hunt Sunday on private land. So if you disagree with the ruling, I, I would strongly urge you to contact your local legislators and tell them to, to vote in support of the Sunday hunting bill that is currently in uh, I believe it's in the, the PA house, but otherwise I, I'm kind of curious what you guys think of this situation and how it played out. What would you have done? I mean, do you think you would have sat there and let the animal suffer and waited until the next morning? Or would you have done what John did and put a follow-up shot on it to, to put it out of its misery? And uh, it, it, obviously, legally speaking, John was in the wrong here. But uh, who do you, what do you, what would you have done differently to change the outcome of this situation? I guess is what I'm most curious about. Um, so that's kind of my final thoughts on it. T Tyler, what do you, what do you have for, for final thoughts about this topic? I think this opens up a lot of questions. I mean, again, obviously no matter if it's the PGC, United States of America, Pennsylvania itself, laws need to be written with, with common sense. I mean, like we say, gray areas pop up no matter what you say. I mean, the way the law is written now has gray area. If we had, if the law said you can dispatch a wounded deer on a non-hunting day, that opens up a gray area. Nothing's ever going to be perfect, but as long as it just the the every situation needs to be handled with the correct amount of sense. Like in this case scenario. 
Should he have been fined? I don't believe so. I mean, the deer was clearly wounded within, you know, let's say hours of dying, but you, you have to legally let it suffer. It, it, it doesn't sit well with me. It doesn't sit probably well with a lot of, lot of you know, hunters with good ethics. Mm -hmm. um, again, no law is ever going to be perfect, but if, if you could write a law but interpret it appropriately for situations, I think I think we'll find a better outcome to situations like this in the future. I, I'd, I'd agree with you on that. Um, I, I really do think it's kind of a letter of the law versus spirit of the law situation that, that this kind of kind of came about with. Um, I do want to reiterate real quick here that uh, I personally in this situation, although I was witness to it, did nothing illegal in it. Um, there were no charges brought against me by by state police or by the Pennsylvania Game Commission. There aren't going to be any. And uh, yeah, there was nothing that I did in this situation that was illegal. I was just the dog tracker going with to to try and help somebody find a deer. Um, so I, I just want to stress that. On a Sunday. What's that? Which is still legal on a Sunday in Pennsylvania. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, you can track a, track a wounded deer on whatever day. Um, that doesn't matter. It's it's the the finishing shot that was the issue. Yep. So ho hopefully, hopefully you guys enjoyed this podcast. Um, and hopefully we gave you some stuff to think about. Like I said, if you're from Pennsylvania, I would encourage you to write your local legislature. If you disagree with how this turned out um, and you find yourself kind of on John's side in terms of what you would have done in this situation, I think you should write your local legislature and try and get Sunday hunting legalized in Pennsylvania, because then this doesn't become an issue. Um, this is probably going to be the only time I plan on talking about this. Uh, at least in a, in a, in a more public forum like this, just because uh, I don't want to, I don't want to be smirch John's name at all throughout this. Um, and I, I just kind of wanted to get this out there because I thought it was an interesting story and I wanted to put it out while it was still fresh in my mind and kind of get everyone's thoughts and opinions on it, on, on what happened and what you guys would do. So anyway here, uh, to wrap it up, I will transition here on to... We hope you guys have watched some of the, the more recent videos on our on our YouTube channel. We're starting to launch some hunting videos from this year. Uh, when you're listening to this, I should clarify, it's going to be about two weeks after this was recorded. So hopefully we've got some deer down in that time frame and we've posted some videos of dead deer. If not, I really hope you're enjoying uh, the content that's being put out from myself, Tyler, and Ryan. Ryan, unfortunately, is not here, but uh, he did send me a bunch of videos from his Colorado elk trip. So you guys are going to be able to look forward to those. And, uh, well, just go watch the videos or wait for next week's podcast to, to figure out how that all turned out. Until next time, guys, we want to thank you so much for listening. And real quick, plug our social media channels. Please go check us out. Facebook at move outdoors official instagram at move outdoors official and we have some really awesome merchandise on our website so if you feel so inclined uh we would really appreciate you going on checking it out maybe maybe get a hat something something small it doesn't have to be big we appreciate you nonetheless you guys are awesome we couldn't do what we do without you and uh till next time i should uh, we couldn't do what we do without you so please check out our website, www.themoveoutdoors.com. And the links for all of these are going to be in our description down below the podcast. Until next time, you guys are on the move with Move Outdoors. <laughs>